All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining here in person and online. Um, I let me start uh, the transcription here quickly. Um, I want to especially thank uh, Dr. Lin Vu of Arizona State University for joining us today. Uh, a couple quick thank yous. The series is made possible, presented by the CSUSB History Department, the History Club, Phi Alpha Theta, College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, the Jack Brown College of Business and Public Administration, and the Intellectual Life Fund. And um, along with uh, Alexander Serrano, MA student here at CSUSB, um, we organized this, uh, uh, he and I organized the series together, and I want to thank Alexander and also Pam Crossan, who's in our history department, uh, for making all these events possible. Um, and most importantly, of course, I want to thank uh, 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 Professor Vu for joining us today. <laughs> professor Vu is Assistant Professor of History in the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies at ASU. Her first book, which we'll be hearing a little bit about today, uh, which just came in this morning, and I'm very excited to read is Governing the Dead, Martyrs, Memorials, and Necro-Citizenship in Modern China from Cornell University Press, came out just last year. It examines the efforts of the Chinese nation state to record, commemorate, and compensate for military and civilian dead and how such efforts transform social and cultural institutions. Her ongoing projects include war commemoration, virtuous citizenship, terrorism and insurgencies and sovereignty at the turn of the 20th century in East and Southeast Asia. Professor Vu teaches about topics uh, such as violence in modern China, memories of wars and global history. Uh, she received her PhD from UC Berkeley, her MA from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, her BA from Connecticut College um, in New London, and she's the recipient of numerous awards um, including the Zhang Jingguo Foundation grant in 2017, and also a Fulbright uh, a research grant in 2014 and 2015. Um, and in the chat, I'll be sharing Professor Vu's uh, full faculty profile and also uh, a link to, uh, to the book that we're going to be hearing a little bit about today. So please join me. We can do a, a, a real life applause. Please join me in welcoming Professor Vu. In my turn. Yes, thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, unfortunately, I cannot see everyone, but um, I'll please ask any question um, during the talk or after the talk or any time in the future. Um, so I published this book last year, and uh, I really hope that I will be on a tour bus, you know, giving talks all over the country. Uh, but unfortunately, this the pandemic. Um, but uh, I'm very honored to be here today and thanks uh, to Jeremy and Alexander for inviting me, um, especially when the invitation comes from Cal State. I'm a product of, you know, California uh, public school. So I'm very happy to um, contribute to a um, lively, hopefully, uh, hopefully lively and um, scholarly conversation about my book. Um, so this book is, uh, you know, of course, like any other books, it takes a long time to write, uh, but I won't get into that. Um, today, I want to talk a little bit about the idea of nickel politics and modern China. And um, let me just get straight to my talk so that we have some time to end for questions and maybe some stories from my research and writing experience. So, um, <clears throat> As you probably already know, tens of millions of the war dead in the 20th century China. And um, these war dead shaped modern China in most profound ways. But scholarship on the 20th century conflicts in the China field often focuses heavily on the top level um, political maneuvers or the human suffering. My book, Governing the Dead, addresses how the nation state's attempts to manage the war dead set up terms with unique social and cultural characteristics for the Chinese modernity. And I want to emphasize the broader premise of my research. That is, the dead in the form of spirits and identities are visible to the modern nation state in contrary, in contrary to the secularization argument. The state does not see the dead, but the nation does. 
The early modern state let corpses rot in battlefields, but the modern nation state collects, buries, and enshrines the spirits of the dead. More importantly, the nation sees the power invested in the posthumous selves by social and cultural institu institutions and thus seeks to appropriate such power. So my book uh, in particular examines the nationalist Chinese state's efforts to record, commemorate, and compensate combatant and civilian deaths, especially the civilian deaths, um, which not um, plays a very important role in um, scholarship just yet, um, and how such efforts to commemorate the dead contribute to the processes of state building and nation forming in China. So from the 1920s to the 1940s, the Chinese states under the Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang, commissioned hundreds of martyrs shrines. They passed thousands of compensation regulations and they received um, thousands of petitions from bereaved families requesting assistance and recognition, many of which I collected during my research in archives and libraries in China and Taiwan. Moreover, the unprecedented level of conflict during the Japanese invasion in the 1940s prompted the Chinese state to track war casualties and create a narrative of a resistance war. So in today's talk, I want to focus on the theoretical implications of such theories. So first, um, as you see, the title of the talk is Necropolitics. Uh, and I think this, um, these terms allow me to frame my research very well. First, um, this is a term that was coined by Ashif Membe. He's a philosopher and political scientist. And uh, building on the Foucauldian idea of biopower, Membe argued that the government uses political, economic, and social power to dictate who may live and who may die. And I think in um, this case, we can broaden the term and think about necropolitics as um, the governance of the dead or the politics of the dead. And uh, the idea of the politics of the dead is inspired by Catherine Vedery's book, The Political Lives of Dead Bodies, in which she discusses how temporal remains acquire new political significance. Drew Gilfenfaust and Thomas Lacour also provide very interesting texts on the work of the dead, that is what the dead can do to us, the living. How can we, how are we literally haunted by the presence of the dead? I kind of use literally as, you know, not literal in this case, but yeah, what I'm trying to say. So in the context of modern China, I use the term necropolitics uh, as a way to characterize the politics that one can participate in with the acceptation of death. In addition, necropolitics also underlines the fact that the civilian's posthumous existence was mobilized again and again in patriotic narrative. There's a lot more to unpack, but I will talk about some of the concrete examples to illustrate the idea of nec necropolitics in the case of modern China. But at first, uh, let me go to this slide. Uh, <laughs> so this is a, a page from Teen Vogue, and I saw this one, and suddenly I was a little bit concerned about my job if Teen Vogue starts talking about necropolitics, you know. What, what are we doing in academia? But at the same time, I really welcome this uh, new development of this you know, fashion-oriented, teen-oriented magazine. Anyway, so if uh, necropolitics seems to be a very you know, incomprehensible or hard to understand term to you, I think this article right here explains it very well. Um, it's, a uh, it's a political calculation of life and death. Um, so um, I also share this article with all my students um, and encourage them to read more teen books or actual books, I guess. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about some of the examples from my research um, about necropolitics in modern China. So first of all is the construction of loyal martyrs shrines. So uh, the nationalist government they built the first public cemetery for the military dead in Nanjing in the mid 1930s. 
But this attempt to um, centralize commemoration of war was not entirely successful due to costs and logistics. So the central government decided that the local governments should spend resources on the dead instead. So the nationalist government in Nanjing um, required each county in the area under the nationalist control to build a shrine to honor martyrs uh, who died for the Republican cause. This is one of the most important projects regarding the dead in Republican China. This project did not go according to plan in wartime China. Counties often um, just designated a space within an existing temple for the worship of Republican martyrs. Many of these spaces simply were converted back into other uses after the nationalist government left mainland China in 1949. Nonetheless, it's quite significant to think about the space and the ritual at these shrines and how it contributed to the imagining of the nation and the forming of community in Republican China. So particularly, particularly in this space, the martyrs who attempted to assassinate Manchu uh, officials were worshipped as new founders of the nation state. And later soldiers of the Northern Expedition of anti-communist campaigns and from the ward of resistance were similarly enshrined. Martyred local militias and civilians could also earn their place in the shrine. Counties were required by the central government to hold regular ceremonies to make offerings to the dead, usually during the spring and autumn uh, sacrifices. The people in each of these counties also are, were required to attend. So all these activities to commemorate the dead created a sense of community and belonging amongst the participants. This formation of community uh, was centered around the notion of righteous death. Uh, another important development is the spirit tablets. So no actual bodies were buried in the shrines that I was talking about, but only the names of martyrs were carved on those wooden tablets. And the ceremonies held in this shrine was based on uh, the tradition of ancestor worship. So the spirits were conjured up during the commemorative events to remind the living uh, in attendance of the necessary sacrifice for the survival of the nation. So to sum up this part, those martyr shrines and the rituals created a national cult of the war dead. So the second development in Republican China is the compensation policies. In addition to the martyr shrines, the nationalist government also issued a series of compensation regulations for the military party and uh, bureaucracy. These regulations categorized injuries and death and the corresponding amount of stipend each uh, bereaved family was entitled to. A whole bureaucracy centered around death was up and running. For example, the Ministry of the Interior was responsible for civilian deaths the Ministry of Military Administration, the Military Affairs Commission, and the Ministry of Defense were in charge of compensating servicemen. The Nationalist Party Central Compensation Committee and other local party branches were responsible for dispersing stipends to families of party members and revolutionary martyrs, and so on and so forth. So the problem with uh, this compensation policy is that the nationalist government only had nominal control in most, most provinces of China. So it was very difficult for the central government to enforce the compensation degrees. Some petitions from bereaved family were satisfactorily addressed, but only after the nationalist government repeatedly ordered local authorities to dispense the benefits. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, the regulations also categorized injuries and death so this is one example um, that shows an aspect in the governance of the dead. The three grades of injuries and uh, the loss of self-reliance in the first grade. And the second would be uh, having difficulty, uh, significant difficulty in living one's life. And the third one would be having some difficulties in life. Um, and if you, well, if um, a injured serviceman die within a certain time frame. Uh, he would be com uh, compensated 
as if um, he had been killed in combat. So this is interesting to me because it shows how the state uh, sort of characterized and categorized death and measured death in increments uh, of times of loss of uh, functions. And another important uh, example is this stipend scale. Um, I also find it fascinating, not because, well, because I'm a historian, but also I'd like to um, see how the state um, apparatus works. So this is one example of that. This stipend charts, like this one, place a specific value on a person's death. So according to this 1928 compensation regulations, servicemen uh, was, uh, would be awarded a uh, gratuities or stipends between 20 yuan and 3,000 yuan. And it depends on their military ranks, their circumstances of death, and also whether death took place in wartime or peacetime. And later on, combatants uh, were not the only group covered in these policies. The compensation uh, policies were extended beyond service members and uh, to cover members of the local militias, self-organized resistance groups during uh, the war of resistance. Compensation was extended to pay stipends to families of martyrs and grant them other privileges. So these compensation stipends were not only to relieve hardship, but also to assert state control in the familial sphere. The increasing presence of state created expectation of civilian behaviors in wartime, and I won't talk about it right now. Um, so uh, this, this is what I call the democratization of voters. So with all these compensation policies, uh, it affects the families of the dead as well. And to backtrack a little bit, as early as 1917, the, uh, the Republic already tried to uh, promote chaste behaviors of widows. So women whose chaste behaviors, behaviors are sufficient to inspire others to emulate was one of the nine categories for commendation. And even when chaste women were no longer explicitly commented, local governments relied on the first category of the 1931 comment, um, commendation regulation, which was moral behaviors of extraordinary quality to honor uh, widows. So even though uh, the fall of, uh, of the imperial government seemed to, you know, um, uh, put an end to the, all the rhetoric about chaste widow, actually the Republican period, there was a revival of um, chaste widowhood as well. And the 19th government published many episodes of widows who remained chaste or who committed suicide to follow their husbands in death. Chastity became a very important weapon, especially during wartime, in the sense that feminine virtues were ever more desired as to match the masculine acts of sacrifice in battle. So in a way, civilians were drafted to join the war effort. So in these compensation policies, if, um, the, widow, if the widow can demonstrate that she had been chased, uh, even though her husband died, the state would be more inclined to um, give her a stipend and that thus allowed her survival. Um, so this is uh, very important because by awarding, rewarding uh, female chastity at home, the state also encouraged soldiers to be loyal and to, willing, um, to be willing to fight in battle. So here's some of the uh, archival documents that I um, collected. So oftentimes when a husband um, died in battle, a, a widow uh, would write to the government asking for financial assistance, their expenses, or educational fees for their um, offspring. So petitioners sometimes hire uh, people to prepare their letters, but they also supplied a very distinct narrative of how their family members sacrificed for the nation and how their circumstances required financial support. Sometimes leader of the Baucha, which is a form of community organization, also fixed their seals of approval on these petitions. And uh, if you see here on um, both of the letters, um, actually the, the top one is just the um, 
the zoom in of the bottom one. Anyway, so on these letters, there are stamps um, that petitioners had to buy. Um, and that is a way to pay a fee when they file those petitions to the government. So if the local governments cannot address those petitions, the petition would be sent to the provincial government and to the national government. Um, and the state would decide whether um, the widow would receive a stipend or not. And oftentimes the complex cases would reach um, the national government since it require a lot of um, decision. So um, if the widow was, um, if the widow's petition was approved, she will receive something like this, um, which is a stipend certificate. And this is one example. Um, there were three panels, as you see, there's some cutoff and uh, on both sides of this uh, certificate. So, and then there would be an official stamps that show the authentic city of um, the certificate. So the stamp um, is placed across two panels at a time. Um, so the family, the national government, the central government, um, and then a, the local government, whether it's provincial or county, each would keep a segment of the certificate. And uh, here is a certificate for modern name uh, Lu Weiye, who was killed by the enemy in June 1922. And his family was awarded 400 yuan a year. And this certificate was is issued by the Minister of the Interior, Niu Yongjian, on May 24th, 1930. So the Nanjing government was established in 1928, and then immediately they would um, award um, um, those who die even before the establishment of the Nanjing government in 1928. So death gratitude is for example of how state provide for some and not others. And in a way, the state can determine who can live and who would die. And this is what necropolitics refer to. What is more significant, and uh, especially in the context of modern China, is that the state rely on both legality and morality. So the chance of survival depended on how well the living behaved in the eye of the state. Many petitioners would go to extraordinary lengths to demonstrate that their virtues were worthy of the state's support. And um, the state became even more demanding during wartime. Um, civilians could no longer just attend memorial service. They were expected to join the war efforts in various capacity as well. And um, with this omnibus statement, we'll talk about the next part. The idea that um, civilians were not just victims of war, but they were also supporters and participants in conflicts between states. And this is um, characterized as the civilizations of war. So before we talk about that, let's talk about the, militariz the militarization of humans, of um, civilians' life. And I will show um, this uh, particular example that we have here. Um, so the militarization of civilian life in modern China, there has been quite some work about it. And uh, as you see, military schools became popular. Um, even the upper, the middle and upper class would send their sons to military school, even though before being a soldier would be someone to be looked down upon. And also a lot of uh, Chinese men study in Japanese military academies at the turn of the 20th century. Um, the national government also built a school for bereaved children, and um, one of the goals of the school is to instill martial spirit. And uh, so a lot of values um, became militarized. For example, filial piety was put to war service for the modern nation states, um, and um, there are there has been works about, for example, the breaking of the Yellow, Dike, Yellow River Dike to stop the Japanese advances. And this is a militarization of nature uh, during which Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of the nationalist government, mobilized the forces of nature to become his soldier. But more importantly in uh, my research is the civilization of war. So this, 
this shows that um, civilians were no longer just victims, but they also became uh, supportive and participants in conflicts. And um, this is not entirely a new development and it's not uh, unique to China. Some scholars have um, studied the total war of 1914 and shows that the increased combatant civilian casualty ratio reflects this civilization of war. So um, what I have here is a um, reward regulations from 1938. And it's uh, in this reward uh, regulation, it shows that um, anyone who had died while protecting the homeland would be granted national martyrdom. So the mission of protecting the homeland, the mission to fight the enemy became um, the mission delegated to the general population. Because as um, you probably um, know, the Nationalist Party, the bureaucracy and the military were on their retreat to the Southwest. To the southwest. They moved uh, the capital to um, Sichuan during this time. And so protecting the nation was now the responsibility, responsibility Sorry, protecting the nation was now the responsibility of the population because the state has failed to defend the territory against the Japanese advances. And in this, uh, in another regulation um, that was promulgated in 1946, the national government seek to honor anyone who resisted foreign enemies, regardless of being a serviceman or a civilian. So these regulations demonstrate how martyrdom was democratized and the civilians were included as supporters and participants um, in war. And uh, it, it is very significant to think about that both the military and the civilian martyrs received the same commendation uh, rewards. For example, their names would be inscribed in uh, on commemoration um, tablets, and they would be given, uh, in some cases, a state funeral or a public funeral or burial in the National Martyrs Cemetery. And their spirits would be entered into martyrs shrines um, and things like that, and their families will receive stipends according to their need as well. So this is the promise from um, the nationalist government. Uh, these, some of the stipends might not materialize, which is probably the case. However, the state created a lot of martyrs biographies um, and um, the state tried to record a lot of biographies of people who died for this, for, um, who died during the Japanese invasion. Um, and if the amount of stipend was not significant, especially given the uh, inflation rates in the late 1940s, um, what is significant is the creation of a narrative of a heroic civilian during wartime. So for example, here, um, what I have is uh, a publication called the Directory of War Resistance, Outstanding, Outstandingly Courageous Servicemen and Civilians. Um, it was published by the Military Affairs Commission in 1943. And in these volumes, um, it contains heroic feats of students, peasants, workers, whose deaths were deemed to be acts of patriotism. And these narratives of people willing to sacrifice for the nation was far from being benign as it legitimized the subject, um, subject, subjection of the population to the blunt force of war. With these policies in place, civilians became more than just potential collateral damages in the eyes of the enemy soldiers. They became threats to be eradicated and um, not to sidetrack, but thinking about the situation in Ukraine, it seems, uh, my research certainly seems quite um, relevant here. And um, so this inclusion of the civilians into the pantheon of the Chinese Republican martyrdom, it also denotes the incorporation of the general population into the nation state, um, albeit posthumously. So what I'm trying to say here is that the citizens, um, the people can become part of the nation state 
if they are willing to die for the nation, willing to die for the nation state. And in many ways, they already died before they could be incorporated into the nation state. And let me show an example here. So this is, um, So in this biography here, it shows that um, there are two martyrs. One is an elderly villager named uh, Sonia Joe, and he was taking shelter in an ancestral village, uh, ancestral temple, when the enemy arrived and burned it down. But he exclaimed, my head can be cut off, but it cannot be dishonored. And then he resisted the enemy's order to work in the shop dead. And um, another biography is of a 14 years old student and he let, um, he was ordered by the enemies to um, lead, to lead them to where the, um, the, the Chinese soldiers were hiding, were hiding. But instead the student led the enemies into an ambush and um, he of course um, angered the enemy and um, they uh, stabbed him to death. But uh, at, the moment, at the moment of his, his death, he yelled, long live China, Zhongguo uh, Wan Shui. So both uh, were recognized as martyrs at the national level, and the family was supposed to receive compensation. So um, these kind of biographies, um, they might, um, I'm not questioning their um, validity, validity. Um, but I think these biographies, if anything, were part of the state's imagination or dictation of how civilians should behave in wartime. So, but also at the end of um, the 1940s, instead of the long letters, uh, petition letters that I showed at the beginning, now when people want to petition to the government for compensation, they will support a much more condensed and standardized form, as you see here, um, a form submitted by a, my, um, a man from Hunan. And he included the biographical information of his grandparents, parents, siblings, and children. Um, and again, the narrative here is that the martyr, when he was being killed, he did not stop yelling, long live the Republic of China, Zhonghua Ming Wu Wanshui. And he cursed the Japanese unto death, a very common trope of bravery. And um, this form and the standardized language allowed family to um, appeal to the state more effectively. Um, and with this standardization, the state could better um, systematically and more efficiently collect the biographies of the dead and furthering its rhetoric of war death as the worthiest sacrifice. So in conclusion, um, I, my research has been about how the war dead shaped modern China. And uh, I'm, Try, I'm, I'm seeing here that the fall of the imperial states and the subsequent wars did not destroy, but actually strengthened the idea of the Chinese nation and the structure of a Chinese state. The multitude of the war dead, even though, even though they were immobile and silent, but they were quite potent and um, powerful. And in many ways, the war dead empowered the imagination of the nation and the institutionalization of the state. Even though the communist forces prevailed in 1949, the nationalist government had already laid the foundation for the modern nation state, especially through the governance of these dead. As with other nation state leaders in the world, the Chinese nationalists attempted to make the dead work for, the na for their nation building and state building enterprise. The first task of governing the dead was to create the idea of what was a good death and uh, what would be a bad one. Uh, the good one would be, you know, dying for the nation. Now, this, this was a challenge for uh, the nationalist government because, as you may know, a violent demise was very unconfucian, very not confucian to die violently and away from home. Uh, but the state turned a violent death into a necessary and even a desirable event in the age of revolution. 
An unfilial act of seeking death was compensated by the preservation of social and familial norms, as shown in the conservation of female virtues. The nationalist compensation law assured the martyr that his widow would remain chaste, his parents would be provided for until death, and his heir would pursue an education and prolong the lineage. And for those without a family, the state promised them an afterlife in local shrines where their spirits would receive proper sacrifices. The institutional capacity to manage the dead was critical to the formation of the modern nation state in China. The war of resistance against the Japanese army developed and even intensified the idea of China as a nation, as you see in those biographies of martyrs. And especially in the ritualized phase of the martyr shrines on national days, the departed would be conjured up as ancestral citizens of the new nation, lending legitimacy to the weak central government. The presence of martyr shrines in many localities and the public sacrifices to a recognized group of the dead at regular intervals allowed the living to imagine being part of a collective. And the rhetoric of honoring the war dead made ubiquitous in newspapers and public places was crucial in cultivating citizenship. Um, in short, commemoration turned death into an, an um, inalienable part of the making of the Chinese modern state. And even when uh, the compensation stipends were no longer forthcoming from the retreating state during the war against the Japanese army, uh, receiving an official document in recognition of one's death produced some sort of consol consolation as well. And the official recognition of martyrdom was, um, in fact, very desirable for people who experienced um, war and conflict. But in a way, this recognition of martyrdom was uh, quite insidious, as I may put it. Death granted Chinese people membership in the nation state as the sacrifice of life was the ultimate proof of their devotion to the nation. So necropolitics is not only the power of the state to expose segments of the population to death, but also the power of the nation to turn death into a desire, as you see in some of the, in some of the martyrs' biographies. Um, people seem to seek death by anger the enemy in many ways. Furthermore, honoring the civilians who are left to defend uh, themselves, the nationalist government claimed national unity against a common enemy. Within the nation state, the political authorities supposedly mon monopolized the use of force and protect civilians against violence. The laws of war dictate that certain rules must be respected, one of which requires there to be a clear distinction between combatants and civilians. But there was not a case in Republican China, especially in the 1940s, because the state eliminated the distinction between military forces and the civilian population. And the celebration of civilian deaths had a profound effect not only on modern China, but also on our contemporary world, as we witness and as we actually are witnessing uh, an unprecedented level of violence due to organizational and ideological developments that enabled and legitimized quality. In the case of 20th century China, one such ideological development was a nation state granting each of its members the right to die as a martyr. So the necro power of the state was not limited to subjecting segments of the population to death it included urging civilians to take their own lives in exchange for posthumous honors. And that would be the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Vu. And we got a little bit of the live uh, applause here uh, from the group. So thank you uh, so much. That was that was a really fascinating talk. Um, even more. Uh, excited about reading the book, and I've been flipping through it a little bit um, during the talk, uh, just, just following up on a couple of points that you made. I want to open the floor to anybody joining us online and also in the room here before I 
uh, pull rank and start asking my many questions here. So if anybody online wants to either raise your hand virtually, post a question to the chat, um, you can do that. You're welcome to do that. And anybody here in the room, if you have questions, uh, uh, please go ahead and, and raise hands and, and jump in. Alexander, why don't you lead us off? Um, so what pointed you towards necropolitics in the first place? Because this is a fascinating topic, especially on the body. That's something my thesis work actually deals with. So uh, um, I, was, I was very intrigued into what you were talking about. But what specifically pointed you in this direction? Did you get uh, that? Yes. Okay. Um, I might not answer your uh, question directly, but um, when I went into the field doing research, um, I was looking to find out how um, China managed to, you know, how, managed to sort of take care of millions of poor dead. What happens to all these bodies? That was my first instinct or, you know, uh, my drive to go into this research. I was trying to find out how did they, you know, manage to bury or dispose of these bodies. And anyway, because um, in my head, I imagine that would be a very large undertaking. You just have to spend so much resources and create a bureaucracy to take care of the actual physical remains of the dead. Because as you know, you know, World War II, um, the Chinese Civil War were quite deadly. Um, in China. Um, but I couldn't find a lot of information about that. Um, so I turned my attention to, you know, how the state managed the dead um, as some sort of identities and how did they manage the bereaved families. And um, that's when I um, start to think about, you know, the politics of the dead. And that leads to me to think about necropolitics which I, you know, sort of broadly define as the politics of the dead instead of um, just um, the idea that the state can decide who may live and who may die. Yeah. Thanks. And then another question. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for coming into this with us today, Doctor. Uh, this is a very interesting subject. I was very interested in it. And uh, I wanted to ask why, I know probably this is, uh, why, why nationalist China? Why this little, uh, like little part of history of like, uh, like a like a nation state China? Why not like post Civil War or like the the Communist state, for example? Why 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 this like a uh, like little time period in the like the the great like the 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 wide ranging history of like China? Ah, uh, yes, that's a great question. So uh, you know, people. Not so much these days because it has been a lot of revisionist history about uh, the period that is known as Republican China. Uh, before that, you know, um, Republican China, which is from 1911 to 1945, it was usually viewed as not very significant. The nationalist state was weak. They couldn't do a lot of things. Um, it was a communist that was able to achieve a lot of, you know, nation building and state building. Um, so when I went into the field, um, I discovered that there was a lot of policies uh, from the nationalist government. You know, some of them were carried out uh, to a certain extent, you know, maybe small extent, but not insignificant. Um, and a lot of the policies that the nationalists uh, created and implemented <laughs> were picked up later by the communists. So in a way, I want to give credits where credits due, I guess, uh, to show that the nationalist state, you know, the first sort of um, um, uh, I would say not very centralized, but strong-ish government that was able to uh, create all these institutions and narratives as well, right? The idea that uh, being patriotic and things like that, um, oftentimes it was credited to the communist party, um, but I think the nationalist uh, government actually built a lot of foundation for that. So um, I want to focus on that. Um, and on a practical level, it's because it's much easier to get access to uh, Republican era documents, both in Taiwan and in China. Um, it could be quite sensitive if you want to look into um, you know, communist era history. Um, it's quite difficult. 
uh, to do so. Um, so on the practical level, I was able to access a lot of documents about the nationalist government, and that allowed me to focus on um, you know, their policies and things like that. And if you think about, well, why didn't I focus on um, you know, the Qing late imperial era or something like that, um, they did have uh, some policies that, you know, concerning the war dead. Uh, but it's, um, I don't think it, it is to the extent of the nationalist government. Um, and especially it's very different because, you know, I'm talking about the nation state, the Qing was an empire, their, um, their rhetoric and the policy concerning martyrdom, I think was very different. Thank you so much. Thanks. Anyone else here or in, uh... Online, I've got a couple of questions. I want to I want to jump in, and then if, if anyone else who has uh, other questions, I think oh, the chat box. Oh, there's a question. No, those are just me. Oh, the, those the, the chat box is me sharing. Uh, professor, oh, and for anyone who joined a little bit late, by the way, um, I posted in the chat box Professor Vu's book that, that uh, this this presentation is a part of, and she also mentioned the opportunity to get a, a discount code for so so for those of you listening online or here in person, let me know. And I will uh, I'll, I'll pass along that request. And thank you for that, Professor Vu. Um, I was really interested in the 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 opportunity of the the state or the nation or the nation state to reinscribe traditional normative gender roles through this process, and how that happens. You talked about the chaste widows, and that obviously is a big um, in the, the the feminist movement from from the May 4th era, that, that is a big idea that's being challenged, the chase martyr uh, sort of idea, um, in addition to things like child brides and foot binding. Um, and then this area of the soldier martyr seems to be very clearly inscribed as male, but I assume there are gonna be some exceptions. And I work on Hainan, where of course there's the big famous exception um, of the red detachment of women, which is just a one or two year thing, but it becomes very big with a cultural revolution opera. Uh, but even in even beyond that specific unit, there's much higher uh, participation of women in actual combat in Southern China, but especially in Hainan. And I was wondering if you had um, some experience with how the nationalist government deals with that. You mentioned um, Chiu Jin, just, just, but, but very briefly and almost, almost telling in, in how brief her mention is, uh, but do you see, um, well, I was just interested in, in, in your thoughts on that as, as this sort of opportunity to reinscribe really traditional gender norms. What about the exceptions to that? Are they written out or are they included with an asterisk? How, how are they dealt with? Um, so I think there are two parts to your question. Uh, first is the traditional gender norms, and the second is that was there uh, female soldiers in the nationalist military, um, and I have um, sort of answers for them. And uh, for the first part, I think I'm, I'm not being cynical, but I think from the perspective of the nation state, it's better to preserve the gender norms. Um, you know, the idea that, oh, if you're a widow, she stays chaste, raising children, right, um, that only helped the soldiers who, you know, who were fighting in the battlefield to feel better um, and they feel taken care of. And uh, this is the same policy under um, uh, the communist government as well. Um, and uh, which uh, I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say is that even with the communist government, uh, which promotes a lot of gender equality um, and things like that, they actually uh, did not want to challenge the patriarchal norms in rural area when they reach the rural area to recruit people for their revolution, right? Um, so actually, uh, in many ways, the woman in rural area um, in China still sort of, you know, live in this uh, patriarchal world. Um, and I think uh, to give an evidence of that, um, China is one of the rare places when women um, commit suicide more than men, especially in rural area. Uh, and uh, one of the reason is actually the patriarchal um, uh, system there. Um, so just going back to that, um, you know, I just want to emphasize that from the state's perspective, if you can have the woman raising the children, 
you know, um, that would be most ideal for the development of the nation. So there, even though there's talks about woman liberation, getting rid of foot binding, uh, but the idea is that, you know, women should be wives and mothers and stay chaste um, and things like that um, are pretty much still in line with what the state wants and that what the state promotes. Um, and it, it makes sense that way. Uh, for the second question, I did come across uh, biographies of female martyrs, um, and uh, of course, you know, it's um, it's um, one of the examples that I remember is was a, a nationalist female uh, cadre, and she was pregnant, uh, so she tried to run away, give birth, and then came back and fight. Um, so, in a way, it's still sort of. Um, the whole reconciliation between, you know, being um, the producer of the next generations and being uh, a martyr for the state. Um, and I think it's, um, it's pretty much, uh, it's pretty much that way, that um, the liberation of women um, might be the talk in the city, it, it might promote people to work for the nationalist government, but when it comes to, you know, raising a family, it's still important for the woman to um, fulfill that duty. Thanks. Yeah, and I, will, I found that also even over the 49 divide, as you say, that, that we have these ideas of the communists and, and especially Mao's early days as being this radical feminist in some of his early writings, but then very quickly after 49, we see that the, the need, the sort of inertia of that rural patriarchy. And you see that in, in, in even in the, the, the red detachment of women and the, and the way that they're, the, with the way that they're depicted and, and seen as, um, you know, in, in contrast to their male counterpart. Yes, okay. I did oh, show that movie to my uh, students in my class and I tried to tell them that it's not a feminist movie. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm running around about that. Uh, Hong Chang Ting is, you know, male. <laughs> there, there is no Hong Chang Ting in real life. And the, the, the Dang Dia Biao was a, was a woman, a 19 year old woman. It wasn't a man and he wasn't from the mainland. And so this is, yeah, I, I, I say, why, are you, why do you have to do this? But absolutely, this is a famous cultural revolution, ballet, opera, and a dramatic film, and they introduce a male character, very paternal. He takes away her pistol, right? You don't get any more Freudian than that. He takes away her gun and says, you can't have the gun until you learn how to use it. So it, it this is amazing. It continues over the 49 divide. And I, I really love the, the conclusion and, and the idea of how Confucianism, which was so important to the nationalist government, doesn't really work with a with a military martyrdom, uh, or or they have to they have to change that. They have to adjust that. I, I really appreciated that that point as well. Um, I want to open it again and thank you everybody. There is the code for uh, thirty percent off. Thank you, Professor Blue. That's terrific. Uh, so anybody who wants uh, uh, who wants to grab this book, and I urge you to do so. Uh, there's the code in the chat. Uh, I just want to I just want to make sure to mention that I don't really make money off my book so oh yeah if you feel like you want to help me out um don't don't feel like you have to buy, buy my book you can just <laughs> find a way to read it and that would be terrific <laughs> that's right we, we get our royalty checks and there's always a good cause for a laugh like three dollars and 49 cents on a in, a in a good year we get uh but no i i think i i think professor who's going to move a few more than than um than most because this is such a such a lively lively topic and you've got teen vogue now on your, you know, you do a Google search and you, you and Teen Vogue are gonna come up. So that's gonna be a big boost. I need to um, write to Teen Vogue, I think. Yeah, so, that would sell more books. Um, <laughs> before, um, while I'm waiting for some question, I just wanna talk about how um, I'm quite cynical about the state. Um, the state is not very uplifting in many ways, uh, not just because I'm, you know, working on the dead, but in, in many ways, I feel like the state has too much control. <laughs> Sounds like I'm living in Arizona, but anyway, the state uh, has a lot of has the upper hand in dealing with the general population, especially when the state develops the apparatus, the bureaucracy that is very institutionalized, very strong, very stream, streamlined. Um, unfortunately, we as individuals, uh, you know, don't have a lot of power to deal with that. So, yeah, I mean, these are the big, the big questions that we grapple with. 
in this. We're doing a long uh, history of East Asia uh, in, in this class, um, but, the, but the, the analysis and understanding the state is something that you guys have been, been wrestling with, grappling with, um, especially as it changes. And in these moments of re-articulation or reassertion of control and how, what it looks like in the, at the junctures and at the, at the pivots, um, absolutely. Other questions from here or from Zoom land? I'm monitoring the chat. And I think that's what like, I'm so interested in learning like like Asian or like Chinese history or like, you know, even like modern Eastern Asian history because we are fed so much of like, as Doc said, revisionist history. So we really don't know like the, like the real narratives. So that's why when we come to classes like these, we actually know the stories behind the, the the stories behind the people that actually have to go through all these things that that never ever get to be discussed or mentioned. So I, I love stuff like this. So it's great. <laughs> yes. I really appreciate that comments because uh, even though you know the book is about the state, um, I found a lot of stories. You know those petition letters. Um, they really give me you know an understanding of how people lived during that period. Uh, of course, you can say some of these letters, uh, you know, they, they're not fake, but they seem to be very um, uh, scripted. But I think there's something there about the people experience as well. That's a fun thing for us as historians. When we get into the archives, as Professor Vu has done, and you read a thousand of these, then the little changes say, whoa, hey, wait a minute. There's something a little bit different happening here. And so that's why we all, we all have to get into the sources. This is... Um, Okay, uh, Arsene, go ahead. Um, I was curious, uh, you know, the, this, the, the, the necropolitics focuses on, on you know, uh, of, of the, uh, of the uh, nationalist China was, was focused on elevating, you know, the, the, the Japanese resistance movement. Um, wh what were the dead of those who were like anti-war, how were they treated? Um, so, um, I have a really good answer to that. I just have to gather my thought a little bit. So, um, what you can think about is a progression. So maybe in the 1911, right, you can be revolutionary, you can find the chain, or you can just live your life, right? There's a space for you to do so. Uh, you can also be pro chain which, you know, that's not a good thing and you might be killed. Um, so there are space for you to be either pro or against. What's happening over time when the state became stronger um, and the invasion became more severe, like the Japanese, you know, from the 1930s to 1940, there was an increase in um, the amount of conflict. Uh, the space for people to be you know, not anti, not um, not pro Japanese, but anti-war. This I would say there's no such space. If you're not fighting against the Japanese, you are the traitor. There's no space for you to be neutral or to say, you know, I don't want to get into this fight. Um, you would be deemed as the collaborationist, the traitor. And um, you know, there there was the Wang Qingwei government when he wanted to work with with the Japanese to preserve the peace and he has the peace movement and uh, Wang Qingwei and the, uh, the government in Nanjing also want to commemorate those peace movement martyrs, right? Um, so there's, um, there's, a, there's a, those people, uh, but then uh, from the nationalist government under Chiang Kai-shek, their perspective is that those people are traitors and um, they would not be commemorated as martyrs. Can you talk a little bit about Wang Jingwei? Because I see him here on the cover. And he is, uh, I love, and, and a, a great rave from Rana Mitter on the back. And, and I loved his book that, that brought Forgotten Ally that really brought Wang Jingwei back into the conversation. Nobody wants to hear about Wang Jingwei, uh, not in Taipei, not in Beijing. And I love it when historians bring him back and, and, and trouble, the, trouble the feast. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Wang Jingwei and how he fits into this narrative? I'm very terrified that you realize the cover is Wang Jingwei. Um, <laughs> in, my, in the book and on my uh, presentation, I have Chiang Kai-shek. And um, why Wang Jingwei is on my cover, um, long story short, 
in order to get a good uh, cover picture, you need high resolution. And apparently only <laughs> under the Japanese occupation in the collaboration government, they was able to take a high resolution picture. And uh, so I ended up having to use a picture of Wang Qingwei, even though he was the traitor. Um, but he played a very important role. Um, um, and I, I mentioned him in my book as well. So when Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalist government moved to Chongqing, um, Wang Qingwei stayed behind and took over, you know, the uh, cemetery, the San San Memorial, all the shrines in Nanjing. And uh, he also performed very similar rituals um, that uh, the Chiang Kai-shek government did. Um, so in the, the forms and the rituals were similar, but the people that were honored would be different. So the peace movement martyrs versus the anti-Japanese martyrs. Um, so the picture I have of Wang Qingwei, I think it was uh, a commemoration of the Huang Huagang um, martyrs in Guangzhou. I can't remember exactly, uh, but uh, the rituals um, as depicted in that photo, it's very much uh, similar, would be a flower, uh, breath and um, the leader would hold it and bound to um, to the script tablets of martyrs. Um, so, um, you know, because of the space, publishing your first book means you don't have a lot of negotiation power on how long the book can be. So um, I could not spend so much time about Wang Qingwei, but um, I can say that there are alternative narratives to national martyrdoms. Um, in Republican China. And that includes the communist, various uh, communist governments and various collaborationist government as well. And um, just to anticipate a question about the Japanese, yes, the Japanese, when they invaded China, they also built um, what is called Zhongling Ta, loyal spirit towers to commemorate their war dead as well. So there are different, um, you know, uh, institutions to commemorate different war dead. I think it's great, I, and I, I love the, the, the picture's terrific. I love Wang Jingwei because he makes it so difficult for us to have easy conversations about, about Chinese history. And, it, and right away, you're having a really rich, complicated dialogue because he's in there. So I think it's, uh, I think it's terrific. Um, I wanna uh, give a chance for anyone else to, to jump in here from uh, in the chat, Zoom. Yes, I have everyone uh, profile up on my screen so you can see everyone. So if you if you want to raise your hand, yeah, please, yeah. please in in Zoom land, everybody, feel free. Um, a couple, I, I I just was making a couple notes as I as I saw this. I I was in Hainan in Haiko when Qingmingjie was allowed to go ahead for the first time. I think officially, I think it was two thousand eight. Um, and there was something very similar to this going on at the, the Feng Baiju tomb. And he's a local communist uh, hero there in, in Haiko. And so there was a big, a big sort of parade of offerings of, of wreaths and that kind of thing. But that, that also, not a question, but I'd be interested in how Qingmingjie from 1949 until 2008 is or is not sort of allowed. Is that uh, is that something you have uh, you you know anything about? Uh, I think it, it was allowed, and that's um, a great uh, question for me to talk about. You know how much of the modern nation state borrowed from previous eras. Um, in many ways, all of these practices, you know, all these rituals and offering sacrifice and spirit tablets, all of these were from you know traditional China. Um, it was modified, you know, instead of to uh, worship ancestors is not to worship martyrs of the nation. But a lot of these, you know, were not completely new, totally invented uh, traditions at all. It was just traditions being appropriated for a different purpose. Um, so interestingly with the, um, so the state, uh, the national state would uh, use the, you know, spring and autumn sacrifices. So the two occasions in a year, I think spring would be around Jingmingjie and then the autumn would be around, I forgot what date, I think it's about, it's the ghost festival date uh, around that time. So uh, the state would sort of align this policy so that people you know, don't feel a big 
rupture from the traditional era, if you get what I'm saying. So instead of, you know, um, so during Qi Ming Chia, during the tomb sweeping festival, you would go and sweep the tombs of your ancestors. Um, and you can also go and make offerings to the martyrs. So it's very natural, right? The state just kind of, just kind of grafted itself on traditions in that way. That's another fascinating thing about the, the Republican moment that, that Bashar was asking about why this 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 moment of um, of Republican China, because it's such an interesting moment in terms of influences. You see the, the, the nationalists with German war helmets sometimes and you see the, the German military uniforms, Soviet advisors, German advisors. But then also the, 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 you mentioned the Japanese influence. So this is such a such a fascinating confluence. And, the, and the, the death rituals, you know, how much are they, is it that the tomb of the unknown soldier or is it the, this Qingmingjia, the, the Chinese tomb sweeping festival? And it seems to be a kind of amalgamation of all these different, different influences. Um, really, really cool. And that, yeah, that, that's, I, I love this, this moment, this historical moment is, is fascinating. Um, other questions? We can, we can move towards wrapping up. Um, I've got lots of notes, but I don't want to uh, take everybody else's time, including Professor Vu's. Um, the seems to me everybody has your questions answered here and on on Zoom. The, I, I I was also interested in sort of film depictions of this and sort of how how commemoration of films work. There is a Chinese film. Uh, and, and again, this is post 49, but Ji Jia Hao or, or um, assembly was the English name for it. And they called it sort of the Chinese Saving Private Ryan, uh, Feng Xiaogang film. And in that, one of the characters is martyred. And the second half of the film is the struggle to get him reclassified from missing in action to killed in action because the widow will get more money. And so one of his war comrades is sort of working on that project as is big, you know, to sort of dig into a mountain. Um, but that sort of exhuming the dead side of things also to sort of settle, you know, Swan John kind of settle accounts is, uh, it's such a fraught landscape. Um, have you come across any cases like that where there's sort of um, disagreements with some kind of local office of recategorizing? Because you, you had that great hierarchy chart of sort of wounded or killed or died of illness or killed in combat and that kind of thing. Do you see any conflict around that where, where requests are not being honored? Yes, there's a lot of those stories and also, you know, um, a lot of stories about widows. So you expect them to stay chaste uh, and you expect, the, you expect the revolutionary to be, you know, um, monogamous. But in reality, there are a lot of cases when they have multiple concubines and each of the concubines fighting each other and the con some of the concubines remarried. And then um, actually I have a very interesting story. So um, a lot of those widows, um, they would adopt a man. And if you read uh, Matthew Sommer's book about that, um, it's very similar. So some of the widows would, um, you know, um, they did not officially remarry. So they don't have a ceremony. They don't register with the government. They don't do any of that. But they would um, take in some men in the household while collecting stipends from the government for their late husband. And when the government found out, um, it's the matter of, well, should we follow the law? Because the widows did not remarry, but she's obviously, you know, sleeping with someone else. So this is not a chase widow. Uh, but by law, she is still entitled to the stipends. So how can we do that? Um, and there was a lot of debate whether you know um, those people should not be allowed to receive stipends or not. Um, so conflicts are there. There's a lot of fight over whether someone die um, for the state or you know they just simply die because they were running away from the enemy. How can you prove um, either way. And this is why the rhetoric about cursing the enemy at the moment of death is so important because it shows that you're not simply running away and being killed as a victim of war. You actually try to fight them, fight the enemies with words, and that's why you were killed. Um, so, and um, there, there are a lot of those stories and the publisher did not allow me to put all the stories in there, unfortunately. But uh, just to say that uh, conflicts, you know, this 
contradictions and all these um, issues were very huge very pertaining to human, you know, these things happen. Um, and there were a lot of um, intricate stories. It's fascinating. And I, it just occurs, I mean, obviously, of course, that it's so, um, you would never hear of a widower, of a male widower being loyal in, after the death of his wife, it being, being sort of uh, true, right? That this sort of, obviously the word chaste is very gendered. Uh, but but being sort of faithful and not remarrying as and and then having a having one of those arches erected in his honor because he did not you know he chose he chose not to remarry after his his wife died that, that's just a, that that complete absence in the conversation. That um, I think it's in my book. I I think it's still in my book. I didn't have to take it out, but there is regulation for male widowers, and um, they would only receive stipend if they could not work. Um, they could remarry still because the goal is to you know continue the family line um, lineage. So um, for the widow, she has to stay because otherwise the lineage would be disrupted. But for the male, he can remarried and if he could not work he could still get stipend from his you know um wife his dead wife um, if she was a bureaucrat or a soldier well usually a bureaucrat um, uh, but yes there's a specific uh, regulation for uh, male widowers as well so well, i guess male widows not male widows but redundant yeah yeah this is, this is fascinating this is so much we could be here all day but I am gonna let you go because we're at time. I wanna thank everybody for joining online and I wanna thank everybody here. Please join me in another live real applause. Thank you so much. And I put my email again in the chat. Um, you know, if you have any questions, wanna go to grad school, wanna work on this topic, wanna know about the archives, um, feel free to email me. I'm always happy to answer emails about research and things like that. Not about grades. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor. I'm going to stop the recording and